Hello, my name is Denise Luneman, and I'm one of the members here at Desert Grace. I'm excited to share this Sunday message with you. Would you take a moment right now to subscribe to our channel? And if you like this video, be sure to give us a thumbs up so that we know you've been blessed. You can do those things below. I've been talking about conflict, and one thing I hope you know by now is that sibling rivalry is a normal type of everyday conflict. Yes. Now, when I was a kid, of course, I was perfect, but my sister caused problems. <laughs> Some of you agree. I, I appreciate that. I always don't have that. And the conflict that is the idea of a sibling rivalry, there are a lot of different things that kind of play in. One is, I don't know if you know this, that every person has their own personality. I know, that's news. <laughs> I grew up in a house of, there were two of us kids. Um, we could only blame things on one another. Um, and we were good at that, by the way. And, um, but my sister has a totally different personality than me. She is in a different line of work. She has different interests. She has different things that she thinks about. And, and so once in a while, she and I didn't exactly see things eye to eye. And I tried to talk her into coming to the light, but you just got to go with what you got to go with, right? Age can have a, a, a big factor in sibling rivalry. How old are, are the kids that are part of the, the rivalry, right? And I always say that my sister is much older than me. It's like 18 or 19 or 20 months. I don't remember. Um, <laughs> But she's way closer to 50 than I am. So, as long as we have that clear, uh, she is my much older sister, regardless of what other people might think. So, but age can have a big influence on how we get along with our siblings. One of the biggest things that causes sibling rivalry is limited resources. So the first one is bathroom use. You probably knew that already. <laughs> this never happens in my house, amazingly enough. There's never anyone already in the restroom when one of the other six kids on the one side of the house would like to use it. It's so convenient that there's never any kind of art. What? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, nothing quite like when, when the bathroom's already in use and somebody else wants to use it. And so there can become sibling rivalry, you know, oh, that's not fair, or whatever else. Parents' attention is a limited resource. Once upon a time, I had one child. One. Mm -hmm. I now have seven. With one, if this side gets hot, you just tell him to go over here. With two, you can have one on each arm. With seven, someone's like holding on to a finger. All right? So limited resources and you know, gee, you must like that one more than you like me because you give them a whole arm and all I got was your pinky. I, you know. Food can be a big issue. Sibling rivalry. Could you imagine there are nine people in your family and only eight pieces of pie. Oh. <laughs> One of the kids is going to have to go without. <laughs> you find out which one was on the good list that day, right? What? <laughs> so limited resources can be a big cause of that. One of the things that kids are outstanding at is their practice for future life. They are wonderful little lawyers when it comes to fairness, right? <laughs> so so-and-so has had enough time in the restroom. And by the way, most of the time when my kids say that, they're correct. They've been in there long enough. But so-and-so's been in there long enough, or so-and-so got the only, the, the, got left out of pie last time, or so-and-so didn't have to do this. There are incredible things that you don't think about as an adult that kids will point out the unfairness of 
win their kids. It's, it's awesome, right? It's true. You find out all the little things that, you know, well, you always let somebody do this, and you never let me do that, and, uh, you know, and, and they litigated for you, and, um, and no, my, wait, wait, my kids are perfect. They would never do this, okay? Just, you know, <laughs> Rivalry only becomes unhealthy. You know, a little bit is normal, right? A little bit of conflict is normal. A little bit of sibling rivalry is normal. But it becomes unhealthy when it becomes abusive. When it's hitting, biting, torturing, which could go through a whole bunch of things about torturing. And uh, 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 why are y'all squirming? <laughs> I wasn't going to use any examples or nothing. <laughs> Torturing could be tickling, it could be taunting by always taking somebody else's toy and running away with it. My, my kids wouldn't do such a thing, they're, they're anyway. Sibling rivalry is also one of the oldest types of everyday conflict. If you want to talk about the different sorts of things that, that are about conflict, we could talk about maybe how conflict has moved over the years, right? Or how we, how we handle conflict in particular. I've noticed that back in the, in the really old days, like 20 years ago, before we had the internet and, and phones that we carried around with us and all those sorts of things, that if you had a conflict some, with somebody, you might be able to tell a couple of friends about it. But if you wanted to go and tell the person who you had a conflict, like at a restaurant or whatever with, you had to actually go and talk to somebody. <laughs> or you had to dial the number and call them. Now, if somebody forgets or they mess up your fries at the drive-thru, people just leave a bad review. Yeah. Like, you ruined my day, my fries were upside down. <laughs> but one of the oldest types of conflict that we see over and over again is sibling rivalries. I, I paid attention to this. We, we talked a little bit about Cain and Abel. We didn't talk a whole lot about them and the conflict that they had and, and ultimately ended up with Cain murdering his brother. Uh, that was the end of that conflict, right? That was how he handled it. And, and that sibling rivalry literally turned deadly. Literally became a, a serious issue. But have you thought much about Jacob and Esau? If you know your Bible story and you know your conflicts, Jacob and Esau have a serious conflict that they sort of need to take care of. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And here's my question for you. What do we learn about conflict resolution from a sibling rivalry? been trying to, to really approach how do we handle conflict. And I'm wondering if we take a look at the story of Jacob and Esau, what do we learn about how we ought to approach one another when it comes to handling our conflicts? So I'm going to tell you a lot today. I'm going to tell you the whole story so that those of you that maybe aren't really familiar with it or you've forgotten bits and pieces of it, you can kind of get caught up. So I'm going to talk really fast. So listen really fast. And so there you go. Otherwise, I'm going to give you homework and you're going to have to go home and finish it up. <laughs> First off, let's talk about Jacob and Esau. They were rivals in the womb, and they had different personalities in life. So we just talked about this, right? That different personalities can, can make a difference in how we relate to one another. Some of us like some things a certain way. Other ones like some things the other way. And in fact, right now, if I were to poll the room, some of you would say, it's freezing in here. And others of you would say, somebody please turn on a fan. Different personalities, different whatever. And so, so Jacob and Esau actually are the only people that I'm aware of that have a, a, an argument or a conflict already in the womb. That while they were in the womb, their mother said, oh my goodness, this isn't just your normal kicking. They're in there fighting already. <laughs> what kind of life are we going to live when they can't get along when they're right there anyway? I might be reading a little too much into that. I'm not sure. I mean. Esau gets born, and he's described as being red and hairy. In fact, so hairy that his whole body was like a hairy garment, whatever that means. We know that's important. And make sure you've kept that. If you don't know the story, it's got to be asterisked right there because it's important later. Both red and hairy become very important. 
He was twins with Jacob, and Esau was the first one that was born, right? So he's like, hey, mom, how's it going? Here I am. All right? He was considered to be a very skilled hunter. He was the outdoorsman. If he was living in the day's time, he would be one of those guys probably that was out on the TV show, you know, how to survive and, and, and hunt and get the, 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 the animal that you want. So he loved to hunt, and I'm pretty sure he loved to eat the, the fruit of his labor. He becomes very hungry at one point. We'll get to that. By the way, if you didn't know this, it says in the Bible, pretty much, that he was Isaac's favorite. Of the two boys, he was the one. All right? Says it in the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. For those of you that are worried that I have more than one kid and one of them's not my favorite, I tell my kids, you're all my favorites in one way or another. Jacob, on the other hand, comes out, he is grasping at Esau's heel. So, like his name literally means, kind of grabbing or taking by the heel. It's kind of an interesting name to name your kids. You know, if, just a little note, if you have grandkids or kids who are having kids, if you're going to talk about biblical names and how important biblical names are, think about the, the, the association with the name that you're picking. Anyway, I just wanted to kind of throw that out. Because this one means to supplant, to deceive, to attack from behind. <coughs> Sorry if anyone was like, oh, my kid named Jacob, oh, biblical name. <laughs> you named your kid Deceiver, but that's all right. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Jacob was a mama's boy, all right? He hung around the tents. He hung around, around the house. I almost have a vision of him wearing an apron and baking cookies with mom, all right? It's kind of the uh, I'm reading into that, I know, but come on now. We were just, you know, so he kind of stuck around the house, and in case you didn't know, Isaac's favorite was Esau. Rebecca's favorite was Jacob. Yeah, the deceiver. So it's really important that we kind of have all of that down. Conflict begins when Esau gives Jacob his birthright in exchange for some red stew. Well, I mean, conflict really began in the womb. But we get it in the Bible the way you really start to understand what the conflict is over with, all right, I've been out hunting all day. I brought home some food to cook. And there is Jacob standing in the kitchen over a pot of stew that he's been working on all day, right? All day long, this stuff has been cooking. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if Esau smelled it from a mile away. You know how sometimes somebody's cooking something really good and you're really hungry and it smells really good and you're hoping that it's coming from your house? And you walk in and no one's home? <laughs> it's this idea that there's this wonderful thing going. He is so hungry. He's like, brother, red stew. That looks delicious. Can I have some? And his brother goes, sure, of course. I want to take complete care of you. I love you so much, my brother. There's just one little thing I'd like in exchange. I'm adding a little bit to this text, but I'm pretty sure this is how it went. Would you give me your birthright? <laughs> you know, you were the first one. I wanted to be first. I tried to pull you back in. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really care anyway, do you, brother? Just, you know. And his brother says, I am so hungry, I don't care what you want. And he's like, all right, well, I've drawn up a little contract right here. Would you just sign that? And... Not exactly, but if it were today's day and age, right? Well, I've had my lawyer prepare this for you, and now I'm the firstborn. <laughs> so, we know that there's a problem. At this point, Esau becomes known as Edom, which means red. He was described as red, he was so hairy that he was described as being a garment of hair when he was born, and then he changes, exchanges his birthright for some red stew. All right. Jacob is also involved with taking Esau's blessing. Now, today's day and age, we don't really kind of get this because, you know, I don't pick one of my kids and go, all right, I'm about to die. 
And it's time for me to bestow a blessing upon whoever I should choose, usually the oldest firstborn, right? We just don't think of it that way. We want all of our children to be blessed. And after all, with us as parents, they are. <laughs> I'm putting you in that too, right? Those of you that have kids, you're perfect parents, and so they're blessed. Anyway. So there's this, this really big deal about having the blessing. And, and so we know that basically what happens is that Isaac knows that his death is imminent. It is coming. It's about to happen. And he says to his son Esau, his favorite, the big red hairy one, he says, would you go out and hunt me some game, then come back, cook it up exactly how I like it, bring it to me, and then I'll give you the blessing, sort of like a, a last meal before I die, and then I'll, I'll hand off the, the world to you. I'm sure Esau at this moment is kind of feeling pretty good about this, right? This is going to be a wonderful time. This, this is awesome, right? You thinking? Yeah. He heads up. He's on his way out. And Rebecca says, hey, I overheard this thing happening. Now, Jacob, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go out to the flocks, get two young goats, bring them back in here. I'm going to cook them up just like your dad likes them. And by the way, I'm going to keep the skins so that you will have something to wear over your arms so that when you go in there and talk to your dad and try to get him to bless you, that you will actually feel hairy instead of the bald-armed person that you are. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Some of you are looking at me like I'm making this up. It's in your Bible, okay? <laughs> Story I might add a word here or there. So Jacob gets dressed in Esau's clothes because, you know, if you're the mama's boy who's staying at the tent, you'll smell one way, like, right? Like you might smell like the chocolate chip cookies you were just baking. But if you were out and you were hunting, you're going to smell a little, um, like you need a shower. And so they put it on. He delivers the meal. And, and there's all kinds of deception going on here. And by the way, you got to love a mother who says, quick, son, before your brother gets back, let's trick your dad. <laughs> right? And so he goes in there. And, and of course, poor Isaac is totally tricked. Totally. He's like, well, gee, the voice sounds just like Jacob. But... You're hairy like Esau. You smell like Esau. Take a shower, boy. Find some deodorant, whatever, right? But having been totally tricked, Isaac gives Jacob the blessing. Isn't that exciting? Anybody else not really sure to know how to feel about this since it's in the Bible and like it's, you know. Then Esau comes home. And Esau says, hey dad, guess what? I caught you this great big whatever he caught, right? I'm going to cook it up and I'll be right back. And he's like, what? You just brought me some food. I already gave you the blessing. You want to talk about a little bit of sibling rivalry? No matter what you did to your sibling, probably not quite this serious. I think it's important for us to stop here for a minute and to recognize that Esau is feeling a great deal of pain and betrayal. All right, so I sold my birthright for some stew. I, I maybe haven't been the best person to, to follow God or whatever else, but, but Esau would be feeling an intense, an intense pain from the fact knowing that the blessing, which is so incredibly important, has been given to his brother. And so betrayed because not only probably he knows his mom was in on it and his brother has done this. I mean, it's, it's a pretty big deal. So Esau comes to the only conclusion that you can come to, and it's one that we've probably come to with a sibling at some point in or another, but never acted out on, that he must kill his brother. Anybody ever felt like you needed anyway? 
I don't think I ever seriously thought I should kill my sister, but there were a couple times, anyway. She's not here to defend herself, but it was always her fault. <clears throat> so you think about this. Jacob says, all right, there's only one solution to this problem. The problem is Jacob's got to go. But his dad's dead. So, so we're going to mourn dad, and then we're going to go and kill our brother. Got to get things in the right order. Fortunately, mom hears about that too. The conflict results in a rupture requiring a separation. If Jacob sticks around, it looks like he's going to die. Now, we told you already, Jacob is the mama's boy, favorite of Rebecca. Esau was the hunter, favorite of Isaac. I don't really want to make too much of this, but it seems to me... Like one of them is trained on how to kill the other more than the other is trained on how to defend himself. So it would happen to be what is going to happen. And so Rebecca says, look, I want you to go to your uncle's house. My brother Laban, you'll be plenty far away. You're not going to have to worry. You're not going to be watching your back the whole time. Everything is going to be cool. This is all going to be wonderful. And Isaac says, okay, there's one other thing that's really important to know. You need to marry a specific type of girl. Stay away from those Canaanite girls. They might look pretty and dance well, but you don't want to marry one of them. (laughs) Something like that, he said. I'm not really sure. He says, go and marry, and this is pretty much not word for word, but pretty much word for word. What it says, go find one of your cousins to marry. Go find one of Laban's daughters. To, to get married to. And so that's the instructions. He runs away. He has nothing. Now, I would say that this should result in something, but I'm not sure that it does. It should result in happily ever after, right? And then Jacob goes and he gets his happily ever after. He finds himself a nice princess and they get to go on and, and ride into the sunset. Conflict is over because he's way away from his brother. He's in a safe place. It's all going to be great. That's the way the TV shows end. Well, right off the bat, we get Jacob falls in love. Oh, Rachel. Oh, Jacob. (laughs) Perfect, right? And he goes to Laban, and he says, Uncle Laban, I want Rachel. He says, yeah, Rachel's a fine-looking one. And so, you know, I'll make you a deal. If you will work for me for seven years, you can have her. That's all you got to do, seven years. And Jacob goes, you know what, seven years? Easy. The Bible says it's the easiest seven years he's ever lived, right? Some of you know this story? You want to say amen or something? Or are you just like looking at me like I'm crazy? But lo and behold, the wedding night comes, and Jacob himself, the deceiver, he becomes deceived. Because after the party is thrown and everything else, they throw the wife into the room and say, there you go, have a wonderful night, get this thing all taken care of. And the next morning he wakes up, he's not next to beautiful Rachel, he's next to Leah. <laughs> And the Bible says that Leah had weak eyes. <laughs> Which I'm pretty sure is a euphemism that you didn't want to look at her. He says, hey, wait a minute. You are not Rachel. She says, I know. <laughs> they go to Laban. And Laban says, hey, well... We didn't get Leah married off in the seven years, so it's not customary to marry the younger one off before you marry the older one off, so you got Leah. Well, hey, I wanted Rachel. All right, another seven years, I'll give you Rachel too. So, anyway. Jacob works another seven years to get the woman he wants. Now you're doing the math, right? He ran away from home because he was going to be killed by his brother. He gets to his uncle's house. His uncle deceives him after seven years, gives him a daughter that he wasn't the one that he agreed to, and then says, oh, well, you give me another seven years and I'll give you the one you want. And there you go, right? God began blessing Leah with kids. 
but it says that Rachel was barren. Mistype there, but anyway. Rebecca was also barren, that's a whole other story. Then Jacob begins to manipulate the flocks of sheep for his own gain. It has to do with spots and speckles and smears and all those sorts of things and, and the weak sheep versus the, the strong sheep. I'm not going to go too much into that, but he's still up to his old tricks. And then a day comes when the God comes to Jacob and he says, Jacob, it's time for you to get back home. You've been gone for however many years. Go. It's back to where you're supposed to be. And he says something interesting to Jacob when he says that. Go back to the land of your family and all of that, and I will be with you. I'll be with you. No problem. I'll be with you. And Jacob ends up fleeing because Laban has heard of things going on, and, and he ends up fleeing, and guess what happens? But Laban goes, wait, what's going on here? I'm kind of shortening the story. If you want to go back and read it, start at what, Genesis 26, 27? Keep reading. But uh, Laban pursues them. Laban catches up to them. Laban begins to talk to Jacob and says, hey, what are you doing? And in the meantime, God intervenes. And he says, look, you're about to go kill Jacob. Don't kill Jacob. You're about to cause a problem. Don't cause a problem. And so Laban shows up, and Laban says, Look, if you'd have just told me that you wanted to leave, I could have at least said goodbye to my children and my grandchildren and blessed you and said sayonara. Right? And that's what he says. Always more deception. Always more. All right? Sorry. I wish I was doing it. Ultimately, Laban says his goodbyes and he lets them go. Now, it's time to meet with Esau. Jacob says, all right, I'm going to send some messengers ahead. And at least then, if the messengers don't come back, you kind of know where you stand. Yeah. Or if they do come back and tell you, you know where you stand. So they send some messengers and say, hey, here's what's going to go on. Here's what's going to happen. Here's about what's going to, going to occur. And they come back and they say, hey, great news. Esau's on his way with 400 of his men. Now, I don't know about you. If a messenger comes back and tells me that, I'm thinking only one thing. Yeah. How many? Does 400 men sound like a welcoming party? <laughs> Does it sound like a protection detail? Hmm. 400 men are coming. So Jacob prepares to reconcile with Esau by putting his family into groups and sending gifts ahead so that hopefully by the time they actually see one another, one coming towards them, then <coughs> going towards them, that once they meet in the middle, then Esau will be all happy again and there won't be any um, conflict, right? Well, scholars are kind of intrigued here because the way that the groupings are done, is it that, oh, Jacob is maybe, I don't know, trying to make sure that the, the family he maybe likes a little less is in the first group that would be killed if they were the first ones to run into Esau so that the rest have a chance to get away? No. He wouldn't do such a thing. Yeah, Okay probably what he did, and it's beside the point. And so he's sending this up, and he's sending all of these sheep and, and all of this livestock saying, you know, I just hope that this will settle things between me and my brother. I hope this will be the thing that makes it so that we can go on and have a good time. That night, the night before they're going to meet, there's a little story in the Bible, you've probably heard it before, where Jacob starts wrestling with somebody. And he wrestles all night. That person touches him on the hip, and now he has a limp. So he ends up saying, hey, you know, you wrestled with God, so now you have a new name. You remember the new name, right? Jacob is no longer Jacob. He's now... Oh, you know your Bible. All right. So now for the rest of the story, the part you've been waiting for all this time, and don't worry, I won't preach, but another hour, all right? Genesis... 
Chapter 33, verses 1 through 11 say this. Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you? he asked. Jacob answered, They are your children. They are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all, Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. Esau asked, What's the meaning of all these flocks and herds that I met? To find favor in your eyes, my lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. If I found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Now that you have received me favorably, please accept the present that was brought to you. For God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted. I don't know about you. When you're reading through the scripture and you get to this point, you're ready for the war. Right? Right? Kind of anticlimactic. Really? They hug each other? <laughs> kind of look through there. Now there's got to be somewhere where it talks about all the servants were back behind, right? And they were ready. The, 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 the arrows were pulled, right? They were all aimed, ready to take him out but I don't see it. What I see is that when they finally meet, this 400 men is a welcoming party. Yeah. Hmm. Right. What do we learn about a conflict or about conflict resolution from a sibling rivalry? When God calls for reconciliation, you can trust him. When God calls you to reconcile with somebody else, he doesn't just say, hey, um, I'm calling you to go reconcile with this person. Whether they did something to you or you did something to them, if God says go talk to them, he's telling you he's going to be with you. Yeah. He's not saying, listen, go reconcile and best of luck. That's right. Hope it works out for y'all. When God says, I want you to reconcile, you can take it to the bank that God wants reconciliation and yep. you are safe. Right. Remember, yep. Genesis 31, 2, you don't go to the place where I'm telling you to go, but I will be with you. Yep. That's important. God doesn't necessarily promise us a successful reconciliation. If you feel like God is calling you to go make things right with somebody, don't just automatically assume that since God called you to do it, it's going to be easy. Sometimes I think we think something's going to be easy if God calls us to it. It's not. It never is. See, the problem is, is that pride and a need to control situations thwart our efforts. Either pride and a need to control situations on our side, usually, or pride and a need to control situations on the other side. And we go back to this idea that sometimes, even in the midst of, hey, I want to seek reconciliation, and you should be so thankful, because here I am, a, a little G-god or goddess, saying you should come and make things better. But I'll make the first step. You probably aren't going to end up reconciled then. Probably not. Jacob, by the way, prays throughout this event. He's asking God for wisdom. He's asking God for protection. He's asking God to sort of underline that this is what he's supposed to be doing. And yet, did you notice that he's also planning for the worst? Yep. 
I thought it was just a me problem. Jacob does it too. <laughs> Lord, help me figure this out. Now let me go and plan something out while I'm waiting for you to answer because you don't answer on time or whatever, right? So Jacob is praying and saying, Lord, I want to depend on you. But at the same time, he's also planning for the worst. One of the things I thought about in this is that we tend to concentrate on, on Jacob's perspective. And the story is sort of told from Jacob's side, right? Because we're seeing what Jacob is thinking. We're seeing what's going on. We don't get a clue as to what Esau's thinking until they met. So we tend to kind of go into this idea of this is what Jacob is thinking. This is what Jacob is doing. This is what Jacob is, is, is trying to make happen. And yet Esau would, would be able to trust God too if he was going out and meeting his brother. Yep. And so far, everything his brother has tried to do has been better. And, and by the way, I may not have told you this part, but you all know your Bible by heart anyway, <laughs> that they were told from the, the beginning that there was two nations being carried in the womb. So Esau could trust what God had said as well. Esau could trust what's going on there, whatever there is. Which brings me to this idea. Whichever side of reconciliation that you are on, you can always trust God. God always wants us to be reconciled, first off to him, but then to one another. You can always trust God. Yep. Now, if you want to look at this, Jacob is probably the one that's in the wrong. But maybe so is Esau. A little bit. If you want to really talk about this, there's, there's this idea that at this point it doesn't matter. What has God said? Second thing I bring up, when you are the offending party, approach reconciliation with humility. Now, again, I'm kind of approaching this from the idea that Jacob is the offending party. He's done some deceptive things. He's, he's kind of cheated his brother here and there, and things haven't always gone the way they should go between siblings. I'm convinced that God's not pleased. Jacob approaches in a very humble manner. You notice that he bowed down seven times. That he had his family and his servants bow before they reached Esau. Is there a more humbling posture that you could possibly take than to bow in front of somebody? After all, if this person really does want to kill you, you've just delivered yourself. So, there's no more humble place than what Jacob is doing. See, part of the problem I think we face in today's society, and I could be wrong here, I'm not, but I could be, is that we tend, maybe I should say I, tend to feel like I'm right even when I know that I was wrong. So I can almost see Jacob saying, you know what? God picked me to have the blessing from the beginning. If you'd have just come back in when I was yanking on your ankle, everything would have worked out fine. <laughs> if you wouldn't have been daddy's favorite, everything would have worked out just fine. Let's not talk about the fact that that leaves God totally out of the picture, but anyway. But we tend to begin to make excuses for what we have done. I tend to make excuses for what I have done. Right? So then when it comes time to reconcile, the apology comes out a little bit like this. I'm really sorry about this thing that happened between us, but if you wouldn't have done this, I wouldn't have done what I did. <laughs> did you notice that in this story, that doesn't occur? No. 
something to learn there, right? I think that it would be interesting to reimagine this story where Jacob shows the righteous indignation about Esau's misunderstanding. Where they get together, and instead of bowing, Jacob sort of puffs up his chest and says, look it, you just don't realize what my role is. And that I have God on my side. And that I have this, and I have that, and, and, and that ultimately, hey, by the way, brother, guess what? A country will be named after me, and it'll last for a long time. It'll be the holy place, and you know, one of these kiddos here is Joseph, and wait until you hear what he's going to do. He's something special, let me tell you. Let me tell you how I think that would end. Then with... Esau going, you know, I came out here to hug you. And as he goes to embrace, the knife goes into the back. When we approach with pride or conceit, we are only going to cause further conflict. I don't know what else to say about that. we're not coming from the proper perspective, if we're not coming from a place where it's only about reconciling with you, it's only about the relationship that we have, not whether I'm right or you're right or I'm wrong or you're wrong, if it's only about, hey, we are both God's people and we need to be God's people. Yeah. Anything else is going to be a mess. Amen. When you are the offended party, you need to approach reconciliation with forgiveness. You are the offender, you want to approach with humility. If you are the offended, you need to approach this with forgiveness. I'm thinking, maybe just a little bit, that Esau could have responded like, you know what, it might have been 20 or so years. But you hurt me so bad that there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about how you betrayed me. There's not a day that I think about it. It's pretty doubtful to me that, that Esau waited and when he started seeing all the flocks, he said, you know what? My brother's actually not that bad a guy. Look at all this I'm getting. Pays for all the hurt and the pain. When I see him, I'm not going to kill him. I'm going to get my arms around him and give him a great big hug and a nice sloppy kiss on the cheek. Huh? -uh. When you're bitter, ain't nothing anyone can do that's going to make it right. Even if they're coming to you in humility and saying, you know what, I'm so sorry about what happened. I'm so sorry about how we've hurt one another. Would you just... Allow us to be reconciled. Yeah. You see, I'm convinced that Esau had already made the decision long before he dealt with the forgiveness aspect. Long before he had begun to do the work that needed to be done in order to be able to forgive. Yeah. And by the way, in terms of what we've been talking about, you are an ambassador of Christ. You are an ambassador of reconciliation. If you're looking at everybody through God's eyes, this work of finding a way to forgive is easy. Because it's not about you, it's about what God sees. Right. Yeah. I know it's not easy, but it's fun to say. <laughs> Esau responds with incredible grace. Because Jacob has come and he's doing this act of reconciliation. He's, he's just saying, please forgive me. And the work of forgiveness has already been done. Yeah. This is good stuff. You should be right. really excited. By the way, this may not result in instant trust between the parties. And Jacob, who's no longer Jacob, he's now Israel, right? But Jacob, the deceiver, isn't somebody you just immediately trust when he's done all of these things to you. But I also would like to point out that there's nothing in the text that gives us the implication that Esau sees anything except a pure reconciliation between the two brothers. I think that's really important. When you keep on reading, Esau actually says, hey, Jacob, come with me, and we'll go over to this place, and you can hang 
with me and, and Jacob is a little bit hesitant. He's kind of throwing up some excuses, you know, hey, I've got these children, I've got these animals, and we're kind of tired, and so we're going to go way slower than you're going to go. And he says, that's fine, let me leave some of my men to help you out. And he says, no, I don't really want that either. There's a couple of things. One is that if he went to where Esau was or Edom was, he'd be going not to where God exactly had told him to be. But then there's also this idea of, uh, can we really trust one another? Can we really be where we need to be? So they sort of go different ways, but they have been reconciled. Amen. And by the way, I'm convinced that, uh, that they were on good terms after this event. Yeah. Bible doesn't really yeah. talk about it much, uh -huh. but they're together at different events, right? I think they got together for Thanksgiving and Christmas and they shared <laughs> gifts. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really hear much more about the line or in the story about Esau. You eventually get to sort of the genealogy sort of thing, and here's what happened in the Edomites and all of that kind of thing, but, but Esau sort of ends up on his own. The story sort of turns to Jacob and to his family and ultimately to a, a young man who probably needed to get some reconciliation going, um, named Joseph. Um, so, anyway, wonder still if there's a little sibling rivalry even after reconciliation. That's okay. the thought. I want to point something out here. We are all siblings. Yeah, right. Once in a while, Once in a while, I mean, I wouldn't do this, you might. <laughs> Once in a while, we go to God and we say, I've noticed how much you're blessing my brother or sister over here. Why aren't they your favorite? Do you not know what I do for you? Once in a while. I try really hard not to do that, but I got to tell you the temptation is there. Once in a while, we look and we see somebody who so desperately needs to be implored to reconciliation, and we see that they're not living the way we think they ought to be living, and guess what we do? A little bit of sibling rivalry with them. Sometimes in the church, there's a little sibling rivalry. I know, it never happens. So-and-so always gets elected to the board. Pastor always asks so-and-so to do this or that. So-and-so always gets to help to pick the color of the carpet. Become little kids. I want my way. Anyone want to testify to having thrown a tantrum? Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious, are you allowing conflict to define you? Or one of the oldest kinds of conflict we see, you know, obviously our conflict with God, which hopefully we've reconciled, but the oldest type of conflict we tend to see is the sibling conflict, the sibling rivalry that, that I don't think has gone anywhere. Yeah. Do we allow these sorts of conflicts to define us? Are, are we defined by the sorts of conflicts that we get into? Are we defined by the, the, the arguments we have with people? Or are we defined by the fact that we reconcile with others? And even sometimes with God. Are we going to be defined by conflict? Or are we going to be defined by the example that Jacob and Esau have given us? That allows us to trust God first and foremost. To, to be able to be the one who's coming to ask for forgiveness with humility. And to be able to be the, the one who, when we are the ones who are offended, have prepared ourselves for the forgiveness. tell you something? 
You're going to be known by one or the other. I don't think you'll be known by both. With whom do you need to be reunited? Is there someone in your life this morning that either something they've done to you or something you've done to them, you guys just need to get things back on track? Jacob and Esau showed us it could be done. Esau had every reason to be mad. Jacob still did what God told him to do. And the story we see is so anticlimactic, it's beautiful. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you that you are a God who provides us with the ability to count on everything you have said. With the ability to do exactly the sorts of things that you have called us to do. But we have the, the gift that is reconciling with you. Heavenly Father, this morning we thank you. We ask that you would bring to mind anybody who we need to reconcile with and that you would allow us to trust you to lead that reconciliation. Lord, if there's a name in any mind here this morning, Lord, I ask that you be with that situation. That you would absolutely guide, direct, and reconcile. And Lord, we will celebrate with you and with one another at what you will do in every situation where we trust you to be a God of reconciliation. Be with us now as we leave this place. Keep us safe until we have the opportunity to worship you together once again. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching this sermon with me. If you enjoyed your time with us, we'd invite you to join us in person for a service. Visit us at desertgrace.org or give us a call at 928-305-1132 for more information.